uh, maybe it's time. So let's start. Mm -hmm. So today it's our honor to have Professor Weijie uh, Su from UPenn, uh, Wharton uh, College of uh, from UPenn. Like uh, Weijie is a uh, associate professor at Wharton uh, Statistics and Data Science Department, and he has uh, received uh, numerous uh, awards, including like uh, a NSF, NSF Career Award. Cyan Career Awards and the Peter Gavin Hall IMS Early Career Prize. So today uh, he will like uh, talk about how a good deep learning neural network will look like. So uh, hand it to you, Wujian, go ahead. Yeah, uh, thank you Ian, very much for inviting me and, uh, and also for the very warm introduction. And it's a great pleasure to give uh, a talk for the audience of One World Minds. So today I'm going to talk about something I have done with uh, some collaborators, wonderful collaborators on understanding, what understanding deep learning. So now deep learning is becoming a new paradigm for science. So in this new paradigm of science, the essence is to have lots of resources. Uh, so the first step is to collect data and buy GPU as much as you can, in the sense that you must be very rich or has lots of funding. And second, you want to train a model as large as possible, uh, given how many resources you have. And the last, you do the prediction end to end from refer representation, computation up to prediction. And this morning, I read lots of people, news shared by many people that DeepMind made another breakthrough. They developed Alpha Tensor, a new approach to um, get faster matrix multiplication. So, this, this new uh, so this is, this is another example showing how powerful deep learning is in this new par paradigm. And uh, so this is the, pretty much the uh, an important feature of this, uh, the wave of these evolutions is that uh, the size of the data is really large and incre increasing. And uh, especially in the current trend of training big models or foundation models, and uh, people need to spend uh, millions, tens of millions to train a model, but the performance is really amazing. But however, in terms of science, it re requires lots of efforts to understand some basic things about deep, deep learning. So far, we haven't understand why, for example, why over parameterization doesn't lead to overfitting. And second, since the number of parameters is way more than the number of training points, and uh, then there must be some effective size of effect number of sparsity or parameters, right? And uh, but we don't know. And the third, uh, normally people use very simple methods such as back propagation, using SGD or ADAM to change model. So in principle, yeah, uh, I, is, it, is it possible some uh, someone please mute yourself? Because I assume there are some background noise, sorry. So yeah, but however, they don't get stuck. Uh, so it's really um, not clear at this moment. So there are three questions raised not by me, by Leo Bremen. So Leo Bremen is an all-time great med um, machine learner. So, and these three questions has been um, addressed by many, many efforts. But so far, the big lesson we learned is that uh, it's not that easy to address all of these questions and uh, there's still a long way to go. And uh, this talk certainly doesn't attempt to address these fundamental questions. It's beyond my capacity at this moment. However, we want to take a slightly easy angle. So this angle is about, uh, is about good deep learning. Uh, deep, learning uh, deep learning models that are trained for a really, really long time. So this is the, a term called the terminal phase of training coined by by David Donahoe and his students. So by this term means that in, in, pre, in pretty much, uh, it becomes a pretty much the practice that we need to train the neural network for a long time. Not only having zero classification error, we also want to train towards zero loss error. Meaning that we want to make deep learning to memorize the data. Okay, so this is a, this is a terminal phase of training. So there's a lots of good things associated with 
terminal phase of training in, in experiments. For example, this will lead to better generalization and uh, it will also improve adversarial robustness in many experiments. From a theoretical perspective, it's, it's, um, it becomes much easier to understand, to analyze a neural network that has been trained for a long time. This is because the, if you want to understand the training dynamics, it becomes much complex because the training dynamics requires us to understand each step in the, perform, the, the evolution at every iteration. But instead, if you only focus on the last, the terminal phase of training, then essentially this corresponds to the solution to a simple optimization problem. So you have much more tools to analyze an op optimization problem. And more, from another perspective, from a sampling perspective, the terminal phase of training, at the terminal, at the terminal phase of training, the solution of the neural network actually is at an equilibrium. So we can get, we can use more tools to understand the, the evolution of the equilibrium for deep learning. So in this talk, we want to address, understand, analyze well-trained neural networks, meaning that neural networks have been trained for a long time at terminal phase of training. So we will propose two steps. First, we will introduce a model we call a layer pit model. So this is a kind of a surrogate model, which allows us to analyze the last layer weights as well as the last layer features. And second, we will introduce a numerical law we observed in lots of computational experiments when the neural network has been trained for a long time. Okay. So there are two parts. And now let's first start with the first part, a layer peer model. So it's a surrogate model. So this is joint work with Tong Fang, who visited me at the postdoc two years ago, and uh, Han Feng He, who was a PhD student at CS department at Penn and recently moved to Ro University of Rochester as, a, as an assistant professor. And my colleague, Chi Long, at Penn Biostats. So this is an illustration of this approach. So roughly speaking, let's focus on the left panel. So you have multiple layers. AR can be 100, for example. In this approach, we isolate the last layer. And, and then we treat the remaining 99 layers. 99 layers as a single box, as a black box. Okay, we do not need to worry about the interaction between these 99 layers and that by treating them as a single layer. And we can do, we can extend the one layer project to two layer, two layers. For example, we can isolate two layers and treating the remaining 98 layers as a single black black box model. Okay, so this is a rough illustration. So now let's go to the details. So we have K, suppose we are training a neural network for K class classification and WL, W1 to WL denotes the weight of the L layers. Okay, so for simplicity, we omit the bias and the stigma here denotes, the, denotes a ReLU, for example, ReLU activation. And we use W42 denotes the collection of all the weights from the L, uh, L layers. Okay. So this is a classification. And the, the last step is to use softmax. Okay, so this is the classification problem before using the softmax. So deep learning essentially wants to minimize this uh, optimization problem, roughly speaking. You have n data points dis distributed over k different classes. So this is, a, for example, the cross entropy loss. And this cross entropy loss wants to essentially, essentially to measure the discrepancy between your one hot label, okay? Your one, which label, which class are you from? And also your prediction, your prediction, okay? If they are close to each other, the loss will be small, otherwise they will be large. In addition to this loss, cross entropy loss, we also add an L2 penalty. So this L2 penalty essentially corresponds to, for example, weight, weight decay in, in training. So weight, weight decay is, uh, is pretty much a standard trick in deep learning training. Each time you decrease, for example, decrease the, the norm of your weights by, for example, by one or two or 10%, for example. So 
now we have the setting in place. Now let's introduce the layer PID model. So in this layer PID model, and uh, so first we start still start with the original optimization problem. And now what, according to the illustration of the layer PID model, essentially we isolate the last layer and uh, we treat all the remaining L minus one layers as a single, single layer, which now is in blue. Okay, so now let's use HKI to denote the last layer input. Okay, the last layer input. Essentially, this is the last layer feature, like all activation. We can either call it activation or feature. And WL is the last. It's the denotes the K different rows corresponding to each uh, the weights the weights of each, of each class okay now this is the layer pin model so the difference between the original optim optimization here and the layer pin model is that in the layer pin model we get rid of the penalty in the loss function in the objective function now instead the regularization term now has been converted to some constraint so this is a constraint on the last layer weights W small w1 to small wk, okay, corresponding to the last layers. So this actually denotes the last layer activations, hki. So now you see we have only two decision variables, namely wl and hki, and they are free as long as they satisfy the two constraints. So now let's try to informally derive the layer PID model. By informally, I mean the derivation is uh, by no means rigorous, but somehow we will highlight the intuition. So this is the original optimization problem. In this L2 penalty, we can decompose L2 penalty into two parts. The contribution from the last layer, the, the contribution from the first L minus one layers. Okay, so this is the last layer feature or activation. And the uh, Due to the duality perspective, we can transform the, the penalty to a constraint, the second penalty to another constraint. But however, we mean it's informal because here the strong duality doesn't hold in general because the here the loss function, the cross entropy loss here is not convex. Okay, because of non-convexity, so this the duality here is not rigorous. In general, strong duality does not hold. Okay, so but this is the some thing we have to sacrifice. We have to we have to sacrifice in order to make the make the model simpler. So this is not one two more mapping because it's not convex. Okay. And uh, so this constraint actually can be replaced by in an implicit way. Essentially, H H is a collection of all the last layer ways should uh, be follow should uh, be from this the image of this function. The image of this function works on it applies applies to this the ball. In this ball, essentially, there are all the feasible last the feasible sets for the L minus one layers, as long as they satisfy the constraint that, that their norm is smaller than C2. Okay. Okay, so this is then we can write our optimization pro program in this in this way. But we are not done yet because you know it's still very complex because here the set the feasible set of this function actually is very complex. We don't know what it looks like. So the next step for us is to use a very aggressive simplification. We call it an ansatz. In this ansatz, we replace the complex feasible region by a simple ellipsoid. A simple ellipsoid. So this is something we have to sacrifice. Uh, excuse me, there is some noise. I'm not sure if the noise comes from my side or from the. Thank you. Okay. So this is the uh, basically the original problem after do taking the dual, and now this is the layer PID model. So in this layer PID model, and uh, what really matters, the dramatic assumption, the more essential assumption we use is essentially is the ansatz. And later we will use some another perspective to, to justify this ansatz. 
But at this moment, what I can say is that, for example, this constraint essentially says that the last wear, last layer width is in L2 ball. But now W here times H. So H should, the collection of last layer activation should be in the dual, dual space of the L2 space. But duality, but L2 space is self dual, right? So the duality of L2 space is still L2. So this, in some sense, justify why we put the two here. Okay, so it's an ellipsoid. So essentially this lives in an L2 space. So this is our model. Okay, so it's the, first of all, this is about the op optimization problem. So we do not uh, worry about uh, the dynamics. Okay, this op optimization problem can says nothing about the dynamics. It only says about the terminal phase. It's non-convex, but uh, it's an analytic tractable. And uh, so later we will analyze its, its solution. Uh, so now, uh, do we have any question about this about this program? Why L two norm is better than like a L one type of thing? Okay, uh, thank you for the question. And uh, so here, the constraint on the last layer weights actually just for, is from the L two penalty. So there's no doubt. And uh, so the issue the is more about the L2, whether it's okay to use L2 uh, distance constraints for the last layer features. And later we will have some uh, evidence that it's really a good idea to use L2. And at this moment, for example, since W times H, so they appear together as a product. So since W is already in L2, then uh, intuitively speaking is a, it makes sense that H is in the dual space of W because W is already in L2. So then we can see that H is also in L2. But of course, this is by no means a rigorous mathematical argument. No, it's not rigorous at all. But uh, this somehow uh, is kind of evidence. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, uh, thanks for your question. So now let's try to use this model to do some, some prediction. And uh, let's first start with the balanced training setting. It, by balance, balance we mean that uh, in among these k different classes, all the class, all the classes have the same size in training data set. So n one is equal to n two up to n k. So can we see anything about uh, balanced training? So this is our theorem, main theorem from from this uh, the first part of this uh, of this talk. So for this layer Peter model, we Let's denote W star and H star the global minimizer. Global, so it's uh, although it's uh, not it's non-convex, but uh, so we only consider global minimum instead of local minimum. And then the global mi minimizer should uh, satisfy the following equality. So first of all, for the last layer features, H K I here doesn't depend on I. This means that uh, as long as two different images, two different data points uh, in the same class. Then after passing through L minus one layers, and then their feature will be exactly exact the same. So there is a collapse. So imagine that there are two images of, 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 of dogs. Okay, after passing several layers, and then the two, two dogs will, will look the same. And moreover, it's equal to up to a constant a multiplicative constant is equal to the last layer feet, last layer weights. Okay, so this is the last layer weights corresponding to the class of dog. So they are the same. And then moreover, it's equal to up to a multiple multi, multiplicative constant is equal to a vector in the k simplex equiangular tight frame. Okay. So let me explain what is a, what is a K simplex ETF. So K simplex ETF is just a collection of K equal length vectors such that each pair forms the equal size angles. And this angle is the largest possible given the constraint. So a very basic problem in, in probability theory 
is that they have k different random variables. Each has mean zero and the variance one. Okay, suppose they each pair has the same correlation. And then what's the minimum value of rho, the correlation? So we know that the, the solution is a minus one over k minus one. And the, then the largest angle is just the, the inverse cosine, cosine, arc cosine of, the, of this value. So if k is two, and then you are doing binary classification, and then it's good, you, it's possible to, and then the configuration will be as follows, the two weights, last layer weights actually will span 180 degree. Okay, they are just opposite to each other. But when k is three, it's impossible that each pair spans 180 degrees, it's impossible. The largest angle will be only 120. When k is four, it's only possible in the case of three dimensions. So this is essentially, it's just the neural collapse phenomenon discovered, first discovered by David Donahoe and his students in two years ago. Actually, the first part of this work essentially is to, is a follow-up of their work, trying to understand analyzing the neural collapse phenomenon. So roughly speaking, this neural collapse phenomenon, David Donahoe and his students through tons of computational experiments found, found that uh, if you, at the terminal phase of training, all the images from the same classes will collapse. And the class means we are actually form a global, we are form an ETF, ETF simplex up to some constant. Okay, and uh, up to scaling, the last layer features will also form a, an ETF. And they also demonstrated that it implies better generalization and the larger margin and the robustness when neural collapse appears. And the meanwhile, there are some concurrent work also justify neural collapse, but they are using slightly different models. Okay, so any question about, uh, about this part? So now let's go back to our early problem about whether it's a good idea. It's, it's reasonable to assume the NSAS. First of all, NSAS, the NSAS is by no means rigorous. Uh, it's, it, it, actually, I, I would say it, it's wrong, okay? So mathematically speaking, it's wrong. It's never the case. But this is something we have to sacrifice. We have to simplify in order to make the model uh, amenable for analysis. Okay? But uh, now we have actually have good reason to to argue that actually it makes sense, at least uh, about the power Q. Okay? So we can argue that if the Q, if the norm, actually Q norm, if it's not two, then neural collapse will not appear. Okay? So neural collapse will appear only if Q is two. But since neural collapse is a, is a kind of physic, physical observation, it's, it's just out there. So in order to match computational experiments results, it's in, so, it, so Q must be true. So this is a, an evidence. Okay, now let's try to do something else. Let's try to go. go so the, your answer to you mentioned that your answers may not be uh, correct or just too simplified. How you can claim that in the, in the case that the Q equal to uh, or Q not equal to two. We are not. We are not have a neural collapse. Uh, yeah. So, so the and that itself is um, is unlikely to be true. Uh, although it's impossible, it's very difficult to. It's oh, I would say it's impossible to verify this uh, uh, condition. Why? Because this is really high dimensional. The computational experiment. It's a. Uh, impossible to visualize the, 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 the set, the feasible set. But uh, if, for example, if this is neural collapse, if we replace two by a different number, and then uh, this will not give us neural collapse. So this means that uh, maybe two here is unique. Uh, although we don't have direct evidence, but we have some kind of indirect evidence to support two. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so now let's try to use neural collapse to uh, the model to do something else in the case of imbalance training. 
So in blood screening, we mean that now we have very different class sizes between classes. Some classes are very, very popular and uh, some classes are, are rare, for example. And uh, let's start with a simple setting where we only have two different class si sizes. And uh, the first few Ka classes are large, they are majority. And the remaining Kb classes are minority. They have less training examples. Mb is smaller than Na. So the ratio R Na over Mb is the imbalance ratio. And uh, we assume that this is larger than one. Okay, in this case, uh, we don't have a closed form solution to the layer P model because the solution now depends on the proportion. Uh, there's no such as ETF figure configuration. So we need to resort to convex relaxation. So essentially we lift the variables, the decision variables H and the W to a matrix. So this is a, we construct this matrix. So this is a, a we have here, we have essentially two K rows. And this is the, in, this is the, the, the transpose of the former, which has two K columns. And by this, con, by construction, this matrix is a positive semi-definite. It's a 2K by 2K positive semi-definite matrix. And moreover, this matrix on the diagonal satisfies two inequalities. The first inequality is about the first K diagonal entries. So the first, di two, first K di diagonal entries of this matrix is about the, the square norm sum of the H factors about the last layer activations. So this, is, this comes from the layer Peter model. And the second part, second half of the diagonal entries satisfy this uh, inequality. So it's about, uh, it's also, it also comes from the layer Peter model. Okay. And so now we have such this uh, convex program. So this is a, an SDP, but not rigorous SDP because, because the objective here involves cross entropy. So it's not linear in Z, ZK. But however, this is uh, technically speaking, it's, it's still an SDP because the here, uh, the cross entropy is a uh, convex. Okay? Early on, cross entropy is not convex because the argument involves the product of two, two decision variables, H and the W. Now we only have one decision variable, which is Z. Now everything becomes convex. So, so this result, simple lemma shows that actually we can recover the global solution to the original layer model by solving this com simple convex relaxation program. Once you solve this convex relaxation and the denote X star to be the global minimum, and then we can recover the solution to the layer model by taking square root of H of X and do some ro proper rotation. Because you know, because in the in the in the, in the construction of a x, so this is um, invariant with respect to rotation in front on the left hand side of h and the w, right? So that's why we need to uh, we need to recover all the solutions by multiplying a a rotation and orthogonal matrix in front of the square root of x. So this is a uh, so now basically we. We, we can get rid of the layer in the model. Instead, let's work on the convex relaxation. So you here you have a multiple solution, right? Yes, yes. So which one, how you choose a, in the, a unique one here? Uh, they are all, all the same to me, all the same to me. So this is essentially, uh, it's like, uh, at, uh, it's like uh, taking square root of a square matrix, right? And uh, if I do some rotation in front of it, it doesn't change its product. Yeah, they are all the same. They are all the same. They are all invariant. Okay. Thank you for the question. And now let's try to do some numerical experiments with the using the uh, convex relaxation. So this for and the, since it's convex relaxation, the computation is very cheap. We can do lots of experiments. And one surprising numerical evidence we found from this convex relaxation is that if we look at the average cosine between all the angle of all the angles between minority classes, okay? So you know that there are KB different minority classes and we compare 
we compute their uh, pairwise angle and the, and the add up their cosine values. And what we found is, is that when the imbalance ratio is above some threshold, and then the cosine average cosine becomes one. So when the cosine becomes one, this shows that the angle, all the angles must be zero, right? Cosine will be zero, cosine will be one, if and only if the angle is, is zero. Okay, so this is a universal. This experiment holds for different, uh, different settings. So we have some, so we call this phenomenon minority collapse. And uh, so roughly speaking, when the imbalance ratio is high enough, when the large minority classes is much larger, it's much larger than when the majority classes are much larger than the minority. And then it's possible that the last layer waves from the minority classes will collapse. So in this case, the neural network, the neural network will have zero ability in distinguishing between minority classes. Okay. The model will think that all the minority are the same. There's no difference between minority. And uh, so we have some partial results to justify the, this phenomenon. By partial, partial, I mean that we can only prove that uh, when when the ratio, when the ratio, inverse ratio go to infinity, the last layer weight, weights corresponding to the corresponding to the minority classes will close will be uh, will will be the same. But but in fact, in our experiments, as long as this ratio R is larger than some constant, then this ratio is zero, right? But we cannot do it. We cannot prove at this moment. So this is an illustration of the, of the minority collapse phenomenon from the convex relaxation. Okay, so this is a ratio. When the ratio increases, increase, and then uh, the two minority classes will, will spend a smaller, smaller angle. Here, the total number of classes is a uh, K is three, and this is a majority. And meanwhile, we also see that for the two minority classes, their weights will become shorter, okay, the weaker and the less, less, less space to ang less angle between, between them. Okay, now let's try to verify this neural minority collapse. So far, this is a phenomenon predicted only by our theoretical analysis, only theoretical analysis. And we are not sure whether this, is, this will occur in real deep learning experiments. So we did a several experiments using real world deep learning on some benchmark data sets such as fashion amnist, CIFA 10. And what we, what we found is that the neural collapse phenomenon really occurs when the imbalance ratio is large enough. For example, if the imbalance ratio here is above is a little bit large, above maybe several hundred, so the average cosine between minority classes is not exactly one, but close to one, such as 0.9. And then the angles between minority classes is really small, it can be as small as maybe five, less than five degrees. So, okay. Yeah. Uh, here one question. So, uh, in this uh, kind of classification problem, uh, do you assume that you know the number of uh, class are given? Uh, yes, yes. So this is because supervised training. We know the number of classes. Now, if if we if we don't know, or if we assume more classes than uh, they are exist. So do we have, so sort of um, we move the threshold below the uh, minority classes so that these minority classes uh, sort of become uh, more apparent? Yes, yeah, yeah, maybe, yeah. Yeah, thank you for the question. I, I, I was thinking about that, thank you. So we just uh, already have another question is like, how would the minority collapse phenomenon change if you weigh the loss of training sample based on the inverse of the abundance? Uh, great question. So uh, there's an easy cue to minority collapse. It's just to do 
uh, important sampling for, for some minority classes, we increase their weight. Okay, for example, if the imbalance ratio is two, minority class, class only, minority class only has half of the sample size compared to majority. And then we can upweight their, the minority samples by a factor of two. So meaning that each time uh, a minority sample is 12, 12 more likely to be sampled than a majority class sample. And then from our experiments, this will uh, cure, this will make uh, uh, minority, minority claps will, will go away and instead new claps will occur. So meaning that all the classes will become equal uh, equal to each other, well, symmetry will, 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 be, will, will be back. But there's one issue with this approach. It will somehow, um, it will somehow hurt generalization ability. If we increase, if we upweight the importance of minority samples, the generalization will actually will be worse. But this is something we cannot understand this moment. Okay. Yeah. Since because this talk consists of two parts, so actually uh, in, our, in our paper, we have done uh, a, so something I said just earlier, try to uh, mitigate the minority collapse, but uh, since the constraint of time, uh, we didn't include this part in the talk. So now it's time uh, for us to move on to the second part of this talk. Okay. So, the, so this talk again is collaborator uh, collaboration with uh, Hong Feng He, and the, the Hong, Hong Feng uh, was uh, was also there in the first project. So I want to say something about Hong Feng. So uh, when I was first moved to Penn, and uh, I, I wanted to do some deep learning theory, and but I didn't couldn't find any students in my department who are interested in deep learning. And, uh, but I'm really lucky that some, someday Hong Feng knocked my door and uh, want, want, wanted to discuss with me. And uh, Hong Feng is really an amazing student. So he, he, he works on NLP, but meanwhile, he is also interested in some of the fundamental questions in machine learning and deep learning theory. And uh, I'm glad that recently he got a job in, as, a, as an assistant professor at uh, University of Rochester. So he will be a star, I believe. So, so this the second project essentially is wants to understand neural claps or minority claps, but down to interior layers. So far, we have only discussed something in the most top, the topmost layer, the last layer, right? So where some symmetry occur in interior maybe in the second last layer or third last layers, will, will this still happen? Unfortunately, the answer is no. We have done lots of experiments showing that such unique symmetry as neural claps or minority claps will not appear if you go into the neural network. Okay, they, they will not appear. So this is because there are so much non-linearities once you go inside deep learning and there's a high degrees of non-uniqueness, meaning that two different ways, two set, sets of, di of different ways actually will give you the same prediction result. It's, it's completely not, not unique. So this is a similar analog. We know that actually we know less about the earth down, down um, 10,000, for example, 10,000 meters, right? 10,000 meters than the moon. So it's really hard to go into details of a complex things such as deep learning or earth. So is it possible can, for us to get some patterns about, uh, about uh, deep learning somehow? So this is a, a we train a eight layer neural network, uh, a benchmark data set, fashion amnist. Okay. And uh, so after training for a while, and then we plot the input, the data for each layer. And uh, we plot it in using two principal PCA, Okay, we only capture the two most important principles and plot the uh, plot into, into the plan. And it, so different colors denote points corresponding to different classes. So you see from the bottom layer to the top layers, it's very easy to see that uh, different classes are, are getting separated. So points of the same class will concentrate 
and the points from different classes will move far and far away from each other. But the, the issue is that uh, we perhaps can use neural caps to describe what's happening in the last layer, but we cannot do the same thing for layers inside. But is this still possible to use some quantitative measure to, for us to understand what's going on inside the black box model? So luckily, actually, we get some numerical surprise results. So this is the, still the same neural network, okay, eight layer trained on fashion amnesty. So this is from first layer to the last layer. And what we found here is that for a certain measure in its log scale, okay, I will describe, describe what is this measure in a moment. But this measure after taking log actually decrease in a linear rate from the first layer, bottom layer to the last layer. If we fit a line, the line is almost perfect. The Pearson collision is almost minus one. It's minus 0 0.997. We have done more experiments. On the fresh amnist, we train the neural networks using four layer, eight layer, 20 layers neural networks using SGD, SGD momentum and, we, and or added. And what, what we found that the decrease of this measure uniform, uniformly follows this linear decay. So the, so the training, so the fitting using a straight line is very pronounced. Okay. So now this is about the first line, first line results. Let's plot the results in a table. So this is the first la fourth layer and the eighth layer, and this is 20 layers in your network using different training rates, uh, learning rates. And the this is the training loss at the last the terminal phase. And this is the tra training accuracy. And this is the test accuracy. And the Pearson correlation are uniformly close to minus one. Okay. So, so far, we haven't discussed the, the most important thing is that what, what is this measure about? Okay. And now let's introduce this measure. To introduce this measure, we use XK bar to denote the class mean for class K. Okay, so suppose class K is maybe it's a class of dogs. So this is the image raw pixel, the pre pixels of the of, of the dogs, uh, average over average over over their sample size. Uh, by the way, this is the, may not be the raw pixels because we will to a, to a, might pass several layers. After pass several several layers, the data will be different than its original uh, raw pixel. But if this is the, but this can be just, also can be just the first layer. So this, then in this case, this is just the average of the raw pixels for this class. So I got a, a two questions. Uh, what is the net network architecture used here? Uh, oh, uh, by the way, so here, all, all the architectures at this moment are feed forward. And later we will extend this to CN and the ResNet. And uh, so for experiments, we found that the, this phenomenon is most uh, clear when the neural network is feed forward. But this will also appear for CN and the ResNet. But I have to emphasize that for CN and the ResNet, the phenomenon is slightly less clear. And the same question is the, is the hidden dimension in each layer the same? Uh, it's the same. If I remember uh, what Hanfon did, the width uh, for all this architecture, the same, the fit for architecture is about 100 or 200. They are all of the same width across the first uh, to the last layers. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so this is the average for the, this class, and this is a global average, the global average. And uh, so here it uh, could be imbalanced, meaning that the different class, different classes may have different sample size. And now we introduce some uh, notion which actually measures the 
uh, signal and the and the noise for this uh, for 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 uh, for the data with respect to their class membership. And uh, this is about signal. So this this is uh, essentially the measures the difference between the global mean and the class mean. Okay. So this is global mean. So this is the average of all the data points in my data set. And this is the average of my all the dogs, all the all the average of all the uh, birds. Okay. So if the xk bar is uh, far away from x bar, it's good, right? This means that this class has a unique mean has a unique class mean. It's very different from the global mean. It's, it, it makes it easier for us to, uh, to classify this class from the rest classes, relatively speaking. Okay, so this is a vector. This is a vertical vector. This is a horizontal vector. And, uh, but however, the signal is not enough. We also needed to measure the noise, how much noise is there. So noise basically uh, comes from, for the each class, how much variability uh, these points surrounded the class mean. Okay, so this is the class mean of all the dogs. And this is uh, the images of different different uh, dogs. If the dogs are far away from the, their class mean, then this shows that uh, the classification is still very rough, and uh, the the noise is still huge. Okay, and uh, so again, so this they are all matches. So this is a vertical vector. This is the a horizontal vector. They are this is a rank one matrix. And okay. And now the measure we use in our previous experiments are all this, this, but in its log scale. So we call, we use D to denote this measure. Essentially, this is a trace between the noise, noise matrix times the inverse of this uh, signal matrix. So signal matrix here we use the uh, plus because this is essentially, you look, this is all rank one matrix. How many K? So K is much smaller than the ambient dimension. So this is gonna be degenerate, okay? So we have to use the pseudo inverse in order to make this uh, reasonable, uh, rigorous. So this is a monroe panel inverse of this, uh, of the degenerate SSB. So this is actually, this uh, measure first appears in Donahoe and his students paper two years ago. And uh, so they use this measure to uncover the neural caps phenomenon. So this mesh essentially is to project the noise, okay, the noise information, the noise amount, the amount of noise into the k minus one dimensional space spanned by the columns or, or rows of this uh, uh, made of this signal matrix. Okay? If the noise is huge, the variability is large, then the mesh will be large, meaning that the classification, the separation is bad. If this is small, then this means that. Uh, SS, SSW is small compared to SSB, meaning the separation is good. Okay, separation is good if D is small. Separation is bad if D is large. Okay, so uh, so this is the law. Uh, this is a universal law we found uh, for many many different settings. So we call it the law of accurate separation, and uh, so we can summarize the law in this way. So DT is exponentially decay with respect to the layers starting from the first uh, layer. Okay, so essentially this shows that by taking log, each time we decrease the log of D by a constant, constant. And uh, in, the, in this experiment here, the row actually is 0.53, and uh, then half time is just uh, 1.1. Then this means that on average, we will decrease the separation measure by half uh, using 1.1 layers. So let me ask, uh, please ask me anything about this law and uh, is it pervasive? Yes, uh, this, this appears in feed forward networks, which is the most pronounced and but this continues to appear in CN ResNet. And uh, does this law provide any insights to, into practice? Uh, I think so. And uh, any intuition why this law appears? Uh, there's some intuition. Uh, can we prove this law? Uh, I'm still working on it. So now let's try to examine this law on different with different settings. So here the architecture is all feed forward, feed forward neural networks. So on CIFAR 10 and uh, whether the class are balanced or not, and uh, using different learning rates. So they are all the law appears 
consistently. And now we, let's, uh, for the fewer, fewer, fewer neural networks, let's change the width. And the width first starts from 20, 100 to 1000. So when the width is uh, 20, meaning the, the network is really skinny and the law is not that clear, right? Because there's a still a, a discrepancy between the line, the straight line and the, the points. So this is perhaps because when the width is only 20, for a fashion amnesty data set, the information cannot pass using only 20 neurons. So 20 neurons is too small to pass all the information. But once the neuron, the width becomes 100 or above, actually uh, the law is uh, very clear. And uh, if you further increase the width, actually it doesn't help. And then we also can start uh, to, to start work on different shape of the neural network. The layer can be first very narrow and then become very, very wide. It's like V-shape. And uh, this is the first start with very wide and then narrow. This is uh, a shape. So this can be mixed, sometimes sometimes narrow, sometimes white. As long as the width is, is above, the minimum width is above 20, is above 100, then uh, the law appears. So the impl impl implication is that for a neural network, it's better to look at vertically. Okay, how many layers and uh, what's the, uh, what's the, uh, is there any filters, is there any skips? So they are more important than the horizontal perspective about the width. So the, now let, let's present our experiments on CNN. So on CNN, the, new, the network, the, the law becomes a little bit less clear. There are the gap, the gap becomes a little bit more, more significant than what we have seen in feed forward. But the, but overall, the accurate separation law is still clear, still clear. If we feed a line, the general pattern of the points of the decay of this measure still follow a linear decay law, okay? An interesting thing we found from our experiments is that the gap actually mainly comes from the filter. For standard filter, if standard CN architectures the filter is of size three by three. At your three by three, it's kind of a bottleneck, similar to the case where the width is only 20. What, what we found, found is that if we can enlarge the size of the filter, make it maybe like four by four or even five by five, then the neural the accurate, accurate separation law will become much, much clearer. And now let's consider ResNet. For ResNet, uh, so this is about when the layer has each layer, each layer, each block has two layers, each block has three layers, and uh, sometimes block size will vary. And uh, at the beginning, we we found very chaotic results. It's very, it's a kind of disappointed for us about uh, the accurate separation law. But what if we replace the unit by using block instead of layer? Okay, so this this ha essentially has uh, one, two, three, four. Uh, it has uh, five five blocks. Each block contains two layers, and this uh, each block contains three layers. Then immediately the accurate separation law is back, and uh, so this is a case where the first the three blocks contains each contains each contains uh, three layers, and the for the next two blocks, each contains two layers. And then you can see a very clear kink. And for the first three blocks, they are equally likely to decrease the separation measure. And so that's the two last two blocks. But however, the larger blocks, the, the three larger blocks are better, has more capacity because they contain more, more weight, more layers. They contain three layers as opposed to two layers for the two, last two layer, last two blocks, right? Okay, so, so this means that uh, for diff different architectures, it's important to recognize what's the right module. In this case, the right module is a block. And then we, so I don't have many minutes, and maybe I only have four or five minutes. Let me uh, be a little bit fast. So here we plot different, uh, uh, we train on the same uh, benchmark. 
uh, the same benchmark data set, we train neural networks with different layers. Okay, what do we find that there's an optimal depth associated with a data set? For MNIST, the optimal depth comes from five layer, five, uh, five, five, five layer neural network, which has the lowest measure, separation measure. And but for fresh MNIST, the optimal depth will be something like uh, eight. For C510, which is more complex than MNIST and fresh MNIST, the optimal will be something like 13. Depends on the complexity of the data set. And uh, now let's try to understand the dynamics. So dynamic, dynamics, roughly speaking, the law does not appear at the beginning. Okay, we need to chain for many, many epochs. And uh, finally, they will, they will see, we will see such a clear li linear decay for accurate separation law. And uh, when compared with neural caps, actually neural caps appears much later than accurate separation law. Neural caps actually at this moment even has not appeared. So neural caps really appears at the very terminal phase of training. But for accurate separation law, it appears at the beginning of accurate at the beginning of terminal phase. So this is about uh, bottom layers, uh, which uh, we consider the difference of the of the log of the separation law, difference of the log. So when it becomes stable, then this means that they are decreasing in a linear rate, right? Now what we found that it's the for bottom layers, bottom layers actually get stable earlier than the top layers. So this means that the bottom layers actually can learn faster than top layers. And then we also examine the law with respect to different classes. So in the case that we have 10 different classes and what we found that basically for most classes, the law is still very clear, so the accurate separation law, uh, but uh, slightly less clear compared compared to the overall case. So this, this may be because for each class, now the sample size has decreased by, decreased to only 10% of the original data set. Okay. And, uh, and this is the accurate separation law in test. Just like neural caps, when it comes to test, the law becomes less clear. There's a lot of variability. For language models like BERT, uh, the accurate separation, separation law is not that clear. So this is because, perhaps it's because uh, it first learns a sequence of token level represent, representations instead, instead of sentence level represent, represent, representations. So there's a gap between different representations about what we learned and what is really the neural network, network is about. So now let's briefly summarize. So first it's about generalization. And uh, so here we train two neural networks and uh, we force the second one to, uh, we, for the second one, we force the law to from happening. So there's no accurate separation. But for these two neural networks, they have about the same loss function, same, same loss and the same separation measure at the top last layer. But however, what we found is that the, this, the left neural network has better generalization than the right one, okay? So this means that the accurate separation law at least is a good evidence for good generalization. And uh, we can also say something about robustness because if we perturb for the ratio between, it, um, between each two consecutive layers, by a fraction, by a, a constant, say epsilon. And what we found, found is that the separate, the perturbation will be minimized if all the, if all the layers have, will reduce the ratio by a same, the same ratio. So this means that when the accurate separation law occurs, the neural network will be, will be relatively robust. So our slogan is that all layers are created equal and uh, and then it must be there, therefore it must be very deep, because if you want to chain a two layer neural network, then rho must be very very small in order to make rho to the to the power three to be small. But if the layer is twenty, <clears throat> right? if rho is large, then if rho to the power twenty, rho to the power power, power twenty will still be very small. So now let me skip this part and let me go to the last part, last uh, mess, last, yeah, the last uh, slide is about take home messages. 
So layer pit model tells us can explain neural collapse and also predict minority collapse. The accurate separation law implies that all layers are created equal. And, uh, but, uh, uh, but uh, still, we haven't uh, fully explained this phenomenon. Okay, and uh, thanks for your attention. All right, thanks, Weijian, for the great talk. So, any questions for Weijian? So, for the audience, uh, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, professor. Uh, I'm wondering for the for the metric you're using for the y-axis, uh, it the, the trace measure. It does it depends on the data dimension. Like, uh, if the dimension change when you change the network width, will the Will will the metric also change? Uh, depends on the dimension. Uh, P. Yeah, this one. Uh, yeah. So uh, yes. Yeah, dimension is the, the ambient dimension. Just uh, the size of the of the two matrices is uh, the dimension of the of the x here, and uh, so you say what to affect the dimension? Yeah, I the, mean like uh. Because when you, if you are changing the hidden dimension width, then maybe this uh, quantity will also change because just just because the dimension change. Oh yeah, yeah. Thanks for your question. There you and, go. Uh, uh, I think for this question, does it make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. Great sense. Uh, if we fix the neural network, uh, we only increase the dimension. I think this measure will change. This measure will change. But the thing that if we change the width, but we still change the neural network from beginning, and then actually this measure will still be the same as we have seen here. No matter the width or the shape of the neural network, actually the accurate separation law will appear consistently. Doesn't depend on the doesn't depend on the width. Uh, but you are right. If for a train, we are training neural network, you artificially increase the width for a certain layer. This will change the this will change the measure. But if you still change the neural network from the beginning, and then the new neural network will adapt to the width and making the accurate separation law appear again. All right. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, hi, Weijie. So I said it this way. Yeah, yeah. So um, so I'm very really like uh, you said phenomena. How that phenomena? I mean, like it depends on the loss function. Like what we so like what if we use other loss function like a uh, self supply loss or some others? Uh, do we also have that separations or how that how what has changed? I mean. Oh, uh, thanks for question. So from our experiments, we primarily use the cross entropy loss. And uh, if I remember, we also tested, for example, for example, other other loss, maybe um, uh, L2 L two loss, something like that. I think uh, yeah, so the yeah, law <laughs> appear, but sometimes le less clear. I said less clear. Yeah, yeah. I think if we use the so one hot based labels, I mean, like so one hot label based loss function, we may have similar phenomena. But the, what if we have others? Because so, for example, if we use the uh, Safe to loss. I mean, when those features will be uniformly around, I mean, like in the in the, in the feature space. So in that case, I'm wondering, like, what's your vision? Like, uh, how can we characterize their separations? Maybe in like other ways, I guess. Mm, yes. Yeah. I see. I see. Yeah. Yeah. I see. So this uh uh, when the ways become different, yeah. So yeah. So it might be different. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, we also, for example, we also tested other laws, uh, other measure for for the separation. We also have used the, the hoteling and the wax, which is mm -hmm. in multivariate ANOVA. And what we found that uh, the accurate separation law will become slightly less clear. Less and, clear. But, but the thing that if we change it uh, uh, using a large data set, uh, and usually it will be back again. So this is more like I would say uh, the accurate separation law is more it's very like in many ways the ideal gas law in physics. So the ideal mm -hmm. gas law in principle is wrong because our real gas are never ideal, right? So so they still occupy some volume instead of zero volume uh, in, in 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 the theory of ideal mm -hmm. gas. Uh, but but, but uh, in most cases, uh, if the dimension, for example, if the 
um, pressure is not that high and the temperature is high enough, whatever, and the ideal gas law will still fit the reality pretty well, right? So this perhaps may be the same situation in the aqueous separation law. It's kind of the limit, it's asymptotic. In reality, uh, it's never exact, but uh, if the data set is large enough and uh, if we train the neural network for a really long time, taking the time to go to infinity, and uh, then the law will be will converge, I think. Right, right, right. Yeah, we do observe some similar phenomena, and we try to unify different loss functions, like from the cross entropy to MCR square and also to other loss functions. Anyway, thank you very much. Yeah. yeah thank you. All right, so is there any questions? Oh, yeah. Jinlan, go ahead. So, um, do we, for example, do we have some kind of strategy to detect uh, whether neural collapse happens in in practice? Do you have some kind of uh, some kind of uh, intuition whether such kind of situation happened? You mentioned that it, uh, if we go long time, that this kind of situation will happen. But uh, uh, if we stop at some stage, do we? Uh, have some kind of uh, uh, intuition these uh, neural collapse happens or not? Uh, so neural collapse is just uh, a about uh, the last layer weights and the last layer features. So uh, it, it's very easy to verify. We just collect, uh, we just, uh, for example, you can compute their angles, right? And, the cons and also compute their a within class variation and the between class variation. Uh, if the angle is like, for example, in the three case, uh, it's like 120 degree, so or something between, then it's neural collapse. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, Donahoe and his students has a in their paper has a very nice animation, which is not animation because the it's about it's about real experiments, showing that how data points will converge to the accurate angular form. Actually, it's a very a very very nice. Uh, the dem demonstration of the, the phenomena. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thank you. All right. So I think uh, let's thanks to speak again. So we just great talk. Yeah. So we can, yeah. 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 Thank you, Yi, for uh, very much. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks, everybody, for staying with me. Thank you. Great talk. Yeah.